Americans. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day three of the SSI Youth Solutions Projects Conference. Before we get into some opening remarks, I'd like to make some um, thank some people for their hard work on this project. First, I would love to thank our federal partners for their collaborative efforts to help us along the way. We could have never gotten to this point without our federal partners from Social Security Administration, Department of Education, Department of Health and Human Services. From start to finish, they have played an integral role in making sure this came out um, in a positive manner, and we'd like to thank you for that. we also like to thank Mathematica. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Mathematica throughout this process, and they have been an incredible partner, have demonstrated incredible expertise in this area and professionalism throughout this contract. And I also like to thank our subject matter experts for their expertise, their participation, and sharing their their expertise with us in this um, forum. So I'd like to thank you as well. So before I get started, I just wanted to talk to you guys about why ODEP cares so much about youth. Um, and there's a multitude of reasons. We recognize that young people with disabilities have to be at the table. They have to have a voice. We also recognize that we have to collaborate. We cannot do things in a vacuum. We need to include our federal partners, all of our external partners, people that are stakeholders who can be practitioners, policymakers, family members, as well as the individual themselves need to be part of this process and need to have a uh, seat at the table. And we also want to ensure that what we are doing is comprehensive and holistic. We understand that young people with disabilities have unique needs and those needs need to be met. And oftentimes we need to collaborate in order to find innovative and creative ways to do so. But we know now more than ever, young people are gonna need these type of services, need these innovative thoughts because their challenges are intense as we move forward. They've always been complex. We've always been dealing with young people who have been dealing with multitude of issues. And as I mentioned earlier, we have to be comprehensive in our approach. But we also recognize that this past year has made those issues even more complex. The pandemic, the racial unrest, as well as the mental health issues and concerns, the access to resources or lack of, the need to ensure that people understand the needs of young people with disabilities and these um, complex issues are important. So more than ever, it's time for us to think innovatively, work with subject matter experts that have an idea of what's going on so that the federal government can make those decisions and think innovatively when we think about ways to improve the employment and post-secondary outcomes for young people with disabilities. ODEP has been in this space for a long time. Through our work through the Guidepost for Success, we recognize that young people need five key things when they're transitioning from a secondary setting to either employment or post-secondary. They need to be prepared for school. They need to be career developed and understand where their skill sets lie and where how they can be applied in work settings. They need to understand how to lead and where their strengths are as, as well as how to apply them. They need to be connected to their community, understand what resources out there and how to connect to them. And we can't forget the families. Families are an integral part of this and need to be part of this process. So we have an opportunity to hear from subject matter experts who are gonna provide us with innovative, novel and creative ways and ideas to really help young people make that transition to post-secondary and employment settings. And today's focus is on disability employment curricula and connecting to post-secondary. And we need to ensure that these that we try to create more opportunities for young people with disabilities to improve these outcomes and ensure that they have an opportunity to get into good career pathways and employment settings. So with that, I'd like you to pass it back to Andrew. Andrew? Thank you, Kirk, for that welcome. And uh, welcome again, everyone, to this third day of the SSI Youth Solutions Conference. 
My name is Andrew Langan, and I'm a researcher at Mathematica. And over the past year, I've had the pleasure of being a project liaison for several of the author groups we've heard from and we'll hear from again today. Uh, to give you a sense of where we're going to go today uh, with the rest of the events, following these opening remarks, we'll hear from our four presenter groups who I'll introduce momentarily. Uh, we'll then hear a response to the four proposals from uh, Christopher McLaren and David Rosenblum of ODEP, followed by an audience Q&A, and then concluding with virtual breakout rooms with each of the author groups uh, to give folks a chance to meet and greet and have additional discussion. So first, I will say a few words to add a little additional context to the remarks we just heard from Kirk. Uh, and uh, if we could advance to that slide. Uh, there's the agenda yes for today. Uh, if you have been at uh, yesterday's session or the session on Wednesday, you will have heard this already. So please bear with me. Don't stop me if you've heard this one because um, I'm going to give some facts, uh, which you may have heard already from Todd and ML. Um, but, uh, but just to cover them again for anyone who is joining us for the first time today, uh, what is the motivation for this project? Why are we focused on youth receiving SSI? Well, first, uh, it's a very large program. There are uh, about a million youth receiving SSI annually, ages 14 to 24, and there are about 200,000 new applicants in the same age range uh, applying each year. By definition, these youth have significant health conditions that uh, restrict their functioning, and they, they live in households with significant economic constraints as well. They have low income and assets. And uh, they persist in the program over time. Two thirds of the youth who receive SSI as children go on to continue receiving it as adults. Related to those uh, personal and economic constraints I spoke about a moment ago, many of these youth face challenges making the transition from adult, uh, childhood to adulthood uh, into post-secondary education or the workforce. Uh, they are uh, sometimes inadequately prepared for, uh, for those experiences due to things like um, occasionally facing an uncoordinated service system with many different uh, services and benefits available to them. Uh, to which, uh, for which they might lack information and awareness to uh, help them understand what is available to them. Those sorts of issues can also limit and delay their access to those services and benefits, uh, or even if they're fully informed, they may face wait lists or other challenges. And when they do get services, uh, there are uh, sometimes, uh, there is sometimes a limited evidence base available for, for those services that might be available to them. All of these challenges in turn can lead to various unfavorable outcomes. Uh, we can see a reduced likelihood of graduating from high school, of landing a job or enrolling in post-secondary education and training. Uh, this can lead to challenges with self-sufficiency and meeting basic needs and lead to higher reliance on public benefits. Uh, it can also lead to or exacerbate social challenges like poverty, incarceration, or unintended pregnancy. That brings us to this project. For the SSI Youth Solutions Project, ODEP funded 12 papers. Uh, these were selected through a competitive process and written by subject matter expert teams. And each of them explores uh, potential innovation to advance employment and other outcomes for youth receiving SSI. Some of these are new and untested ideas, and some of them are enhancements or expansions of existing programs. You can find all of the proposals in full online at the web address on your screen or by entering SSI Youth Solutions ODEP in your web browser search engine and read them there in full. If you go and read these proposals, you'll see that they each address a variety of important considerations. They first and foremost describe the gap or limitation in the existing system that their intervention addresses. Uh, they describe what agency or group at the federal, state, or local level could implement or sponsor the proposal. They describe a theory of change and the evidence base behind it. They talk about the potential costs of the proposal and who would bear them. And they touch on considerations of replicability, scalability, and sustainability. Additionally, the proposals consider issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. In some cases, they describe culturally appropriate or inclusive service models. Many of these proposals include person-centered planning processes, 
and they propose ways to incorporate DEI into program infrastructure, delivery, and evaluation. The four presentations today will describe proposals focused on curricula and programs that aim to improve uh, employment opportunities for youth with disability, either by directly targeting knowledge, attitudes, and skills for students and their supporters, or by connecting youth to existing education and training resources and ensuring that they have the support and accommodation needed to take advantage of them. The first presenter today will be Judith Gross from Indiana University's Indiana Institute of Disability and Community with a proposal for the Family Employment Awareness Training developed along with Grace Francis of George Mason University and Stephanie Gage of Virginia Commonwealth University. The second presentation will be by Paul Hippolytus, uh, an independent consultant also with uh, UC Berkeley, who will discuss employment empowerment and propose a foundational intervention for building employment skills for youth with disabilities. The third presentation is focused on progressive education and early intervention strategy to improve post-secondary outcomes for youth with disabilities. And that'll be presented by James Smith of the Vermont Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And he developed this presentation along with his colleagues, Tara Howe and Rich Tulakangas and Christine McCarthy of the Vermont Association for Business Industry and Rehabilitation. And then our final presentation of the day will be from Marsha Ellison and Colleen McKay of the University of Massachusetts uh, Medical School. They'll be presenting work uh, focused on the career and technical education uh, for students with emotional disturbance. Finally, before we begin uh, and move on to our first presentation, I would like to remind everyone there will be an audience Q&A following the presentations and discussion. Uh, so please feel free to enter your questions at any time using the Q&A panel on the lower uh, right or the right hand side of your screen and submit those questions to all panelists. And with that, I would like to invite uh, Judith Gross to tell us about her proposal and kick things off. Uh, go ahead, Judith. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm Judith Gross with Indiana University, and I'll be speaking with you on family employment awareness training. Next slide. Okay, so family employment awareness training is a family focused intervention uh, that targets youth with disabilities and their families and um, that was the original target audience, but we also target others who support them because um, it's been a wonderful byproduct of this of this work uh, to increase their expectations for competitive employment and improve their knowledge of the supports and services that are out there that can help bolster their integrated competitive employment goals. Originally, FEET was developed uh, in 2010 as a two-part face-to-face training and technical assistance program, and that was converted to a webinar series format in 2020 due to COVID. Uh, part one focuses on building the expectation for competitive employment for all people with disabilities uh, through sharing of supported and customized employment success stories and discussing the transition from school to adulthood. Part two focuses on identifying and accessing local, state, and federal resources to support competitive employment. Then the training culminates with the development of a plan for employment with five action steps and then opportunities for follow-up individual and group technical assistance. Next slide, thank you. So why was FEET developed? Uh, FEET was developed to address two known barriers to successful employment attainment. One was a lack of expectations that uh, employment was possible, and the other was a lack of knowledge about the impact of work on benefits or a lack of knowledge of the benefits that could make work possible for that individual. Uh, so research has shown that lack of knowledge and information about the impact of work on benefits and availability of those services will interfere with the achievement of employment goals. Um, we also know that lack of high expectations for employment, so the expectation that you can attain competitive integrative employment, results in no or low interest in work for people with disabilities. So FEE was developed to address these barriers and operates on the rationale that if we raise expectations for employment and we improve knowledge of employment services and supports, we will increase the employment of young adults with dis among adults with disabilities. So some of the key features of FEET is that we try to really focus on, on addressing things that we know are key barriers to employment. 
So uh, first, we try to dispel myths related to the ability to work by providing examples of people with a variety of different types of disability and support needs, working jobs that range in type and complexity. Uh, so provide, by providing these success, success stories that are uh, native to that, that state, as well as specific to that community in which feed is being delivered, uh, helps the attendees to see that um, there's more employment going on around them than they thought in their community. Uh, two, FEET works to dispel myths related to benefits. So we do this by providing clear examples of how benefits impact work. Um, we help attendees to understand the income and the eligibility rules and provide real life examples, such as how you can keep a benefit like health insurance while still increasing your work effort. Uh, FEED also really strives to help families and youth to better understand the transition process and to support them in understanding the options and resources that are available to them after they leave high school. And then finally, FEED really helps attendees to better understand the wide variety of resources that exist beyond Medicaid and VR, which are the most typical, uh, typically referred to services uh, for students leaving high school. Uh, FEET also really works to promote greater interagency coordination and collaboration through conducting outreach into the local communities in which FEET is being delivered to recruit local area service providers to attend and learn as well as to share about their services in the community in which FEET is delivered. We also work with them to identify local area success stories, people whom they've helped attain competitive employment to come and talk about the types of jobs that they have and the supports that they receive. Second, uh, FEET uses a train the trainer model, partnering with a community organization to be trained to deliver family employment tra awareness training in that state. Uh, we strive for this to be a parent advocacy organization, like a parent training and information center. Um, but we've also worked with other organizations as well, such as a University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities and a Developmental Disabilities um, uh, State Developmental Disability Organizations Councils. There we go. Um, three, uh, FEET works in a train the trainer model. So uh, we work partner with that community organization, that parent training and uh, information center or whomever else uh, wants to be a partner to learn feet, learn the content, learn how to adapt it, how to deliver it. Um, and then we fade our support over time and then continue to provide some ongoing uh, implementation support through a multi-state um, every er, bi-monthly uh, phone calls. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, finally, some of the key features of FEET is that we provide an evidence-based curriculum and evaluation components to states adopting it. So as I said, FEET was developed in 2010 and it was, uh, the components are based on research and it itself has been researched by the authors as well as the states that implemented have conducted evaluations with some uh, small pilot pre post type activities in the short term. Um, so it has a, an evidence base behind it. It focuses on current policies and practices. It emphasizes integrated competitive employment. And we don't talk about anything that's not integrated competitive employment. So if we invite a service provider to come in and talk about their services, and maybe they provide both sheltered work as well as integrated competitive employment. We make sure they understand what the focus of our training is and tell them that all we want to know is about their integrated competitive employment services. So we really focus on helping people to make that their, their employment goal. So the strengths and limitations of FEET, um, strengths is community family-led intervention. So the folks that work at parent training and information centers are typically parents, siblings, grandparents of people with disabilities. So most often, one of the individuals working at a parent training and information center will also have a young adult going through transition at this time. And so that's wonderful because parents love to learn from other parents. We've got research that shows that. Um, not we ask broadly, there's research that shows that parents want to learn from other parents. Um, 
And that works great because the parent training information centers are trusted in their communities. Um, FEED is adapted for each state and community in which it's implemented. So when we talk about Medicaid or VR or, um, you know, Medicaid buy-in programs or what's available through your workforce development centers, it is your state. It is your state. It is your community. You get to put a face to a name with the provider that provides those types of services in your community. Uh, so it's very localized and that makes it um, ideal for ensuring that the information can be easily applied as soon as the training is completed. We work to dispel myths about work and benefits. Talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, we also support person-centered competitive employment goals. So I mentioned on the first page that we have our training and then we follow up with individual um, and group technical assistance that focuses on a plan for employment. So before attendees leave FEET, we ask them to complete a plan for employment that identifies five next steps of wherever they are at in the process. And with each next step that they identify that needs to be done, we help them to pair it with a resource that they learned about in the training so that they know exactly who to go to, who to ask the question, where to find the information so they can take that next step. And then we follow up individually in a month or two to see how they're doing with their plan and if they need any help. And then we offer group uh, technical assistance as we move forward as well. Um, it's applicable across disabilities and support needs. So we don't focus on one type of disability. We try to span the spectrum of disabilities from high support needs to low support needs, high incidence to low incidence disabilities, uh, so that anyone who attends can see their family member um, at, in, in employment. They can see someone in our examples that reminds them of their family member. Um, some of the limitations of feet. Uh, kind of pair with some of these strengths. So adapting to each state takes notable time um, for which that community organization, that parent training and information center, they need to be trained and they also need funding to support the work because this is a time consuming uh, training to deliver. And that's what makes it so effective is because it is integrated into those communities in which it is delivered. Um, so it's very important that it has a clear program leader because it does require ongoing effort. It is updated a couple of times within the year to make sure that links are correct and that the new eligibility and asset information is correct. And if there's new rules that have come out that we're applying that information, and if there's new evidence-based practices, we want to include those as well. So it is an ongoing effort to keep it updated and current and specific to the states in which it is implemented. Thanks. Thank you. In conclusion, so FEET is currently being implemented across five states. It started in Kansas in 2010 with a Medicaid infrastructure grant um, at the Beach Center on Disability and in partnership with Families Together, the Parent Training and Information Center. And then in 2014, it was adopted in Rhode Island by the University Center on Excellence and De Developmental Disabilities at Rhode Island College. And then in 2018, Nebraska adopted it. And in 2019, Oklahoma and Indiana adopted it. Um, Oklahoma is being delivered by a Developmental Disability Council organization. And in Kansas, Indiana, and Nebraska, it's being delivered by parent training and information centers. So FEET is flexible enough to allow implementation across states with different cultures. Uh, we do have, it is translated into Spanish and is delivered in Spanish in Kansas and in Rhode Island at present. We're still working on the other states um, to get those translations up and going. And um, also, but it's not just uh, culture in that way, but just the culture of the state. So I like to give the example of Kansas versus Rhode Island. You know, in Kansas, we started with one day and eventually feet moved to two days because people said, we need more information. And in Kansas, people will drive three hours to attend a training. But in Rhode Island, two days was too much. And they had to back it off into a, a concise one day to get consistent attendees. And people won't drive very far in Rhode Island, even though it only cut, takes like one hour to drive across the state. They knew their culture and they knew they had to offer it in different communities because people won't drive that far to attend something in Rhode Island. So you need to know your state, your communities, uh, how you, if you need to do specialized outreach and FEED allows for that flexibility. Um, so FEED's challenges are also its strengths. 
uh, as, as you could see a minute ago, um, as I discussed that, you know, it's individualized to states and communities, um, but that takes increased coordination and collaboration and, and time. Um, and, you know, needing a clear program leader is important, but that also ensures that it is consistently implemented um, and it is up, kept up to date and it has moved across the state with, with some precision. Um, so finally, you know uh, oh, I apologize. Oh, no, no. Uh, finally, Sorry, you're wrapping up. With current policies and practices and regulations and that we emphasize integrated competitive work em environments um, and we don't promote any segregated services at all. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Oh, and that website there um, on your slides for the Beach Center is the home for feed information. So you can go there and check it out or you can contact me and I'll be happy to hook you up with some other information. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. And uh, next up will be Paul Hippolytus discussing employment empowerment, a foundational intervention for youth with disabilities. Take it thank away, you. Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening and uh, helping us think through some of these proposals and ideas uh, so that they can be truly transformative. Because uh, in a word or two, uh, we've stabbed, uh, we need to do more in disability employment policy than what we're doing. What we're doing has been fine and good and great even, but the numbers aren't moving very significantly. And it's been a long time since they've moved up beyond the 33% mark in labor force participation rate. So what I'm gonna talk about is what's missing. And uh, Judith Grove just opened the door on that subject as did other presenters in this series around the fact that the consumer base, the family members, uh, even the professionals that support them can all profit from some energizing, some information, some coaching, some uh, counseling around how to play a more active and aggressive role in the process of competitive employment. Uh, just by way of introduction, I'm out here at UC Berkeley and having left Washington, D.C. in a long career with the federal government, with ODEP, uh, prior the, uh, to that with the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities. So when I came out here, I was very excited to work directly with post-secondary students with disabilities. But it was a revelation from a policy perspective. So employment empowerment is both a policy as well as a program uh, offering, which is designed to hit this missing piece and to hit it hard and to hit it completely and to give people the kinds of content and information they need, need to be transformative. Next slide, please. I started to mention my history. Uh, well, I think we're on the third slide now, so we'll go to that. Uh, we want to talk today about uh, what's been done at UC Berkeley and through a Kessler grant at other universities and how it's showing great promise around being transformative and powerful in taking people from a place where they have their doubts because of the negativity around thoughts, attitudes, definitions, expectations about the employment potential of SSI youth and more broadly disabled youth and even other people with disabilities, especially those with newly acquired disabilities. Uh, and those facing transitions, whether it's some uh, minimum wage transitions we're hoping for, or it's return to work kinds of programming, which I know ODEP is deeply involved in. So all of those arenas are places where we can think about why we're not as successful as we might be or could be, uh, and what we need to do to up that success rate and make all the other efforts that we're pursuing more uh, to flourish and to be more productive around the outcomes and to move that labor force participation rate. Just a quick anecdote, I remember being at the South Lawn of the White House when President Bush, the first President Bush signed the ADA and the law and we were all in the employment field, excited about the idea in 10 years, we would double that rate from 33%. And here we are now going on 31 years and I think last month's rate was 34.2%. So I, I enter this uh, proposal with that spirit in mind. What else can we be doing? And so what I'm suggesting with this proposal is two avenues of uh, pursuit. 
One is around making this a policy priority, studying it, researching it, developing it, developing ways to implement policy ideas and resources that will turn the corner and develop an effort that parallels all our other efforts in preparing the consumer for what's available and for competitive employment. One thing I keep reminding myself and I'll mention here now is competitive employment is competitive. I know that sounds simplistic and it is, but we have to meet employers at that threshold. And it's at one point no longer employer discrimination that's holding us back. Yet you may say competitive employment has a discrimination component in another sense. And that is, is that you must qualify. You must be competitive. You must impress the employer with your skills and knowledge. And this is where we run into problems. When I got at Berkeley and started to work there with our students, our very talented students with disabilities, I was aghast and appalled at how unprepared, unfocused, and in utter disbelief about anyone would hire them. And that just was chilling for me. And it set me about this uh, effort, which wasn't part of my job, but is part of my profession to work on content and materials that can break through this uh, morass and break this barrier and get people, their family members, their teachers, their rehab counselors to think anew and better and more positive manner. So competitive employment at some point requires us on the disability side, the supply side of the employment equation to produce a better product and to have one that will go in there and catch the employer's eye or interest around their candidacy. I also worked at ODEP uh, as a WRP, Workforce Recruitment Recruiter, and I interviewed over 600 college students with disabilities. And I would ask my ODEP friends when they went out on WRP or others, uh, what was your real honest competitive observation about ready they were to wow an employer with their skills? And how would they do when other non-disabled applicants we're in the applicant pool competing with them. So this is a proposal that has two sides to it. One, let's accept this as a next policy frontier and take actions to make it well known, uh, a priority, and to uh, develop the supports and technical assistance, research and demonstration, et cetera, that'll bring it into vogue around our community and all of our assets so that it becomes part of what they do. I'm not recommending a new program, a competitive program. I'm recommending a content and an idea that is easily added on to, tapped into by existing programs to allow them to develop the capacity to have a fundamental first step offering when they have clients, customers, and students before them who they can tell just don't believe in themselves around competitive employment. How do you deal with that? That's what this proposal is all about. Next slide, please. So what did we do at Berkeley? Well, I worked with the students. I worked with private uh, executive coaches in the mainstream. I worked with other disability organizations. I brought in the Silicon Valley uh, Business Leadership Network, employers and disability in organization that helped us make it disability, folk, excuse me, employer focused as well as mainstream focused. And the students and the professionals and the employers that I had helped to cultivate and craft what became the proposal that I'm offering you today and the resources that are already online free of charge and available to ODEP, to all others to look at in terms of an example of how do we hit hard and hit in a fundamental first step way, this stumbling block that many, not all, young people with disabilities encounter when they are presented with the idea of competitive employment. You know, when I worked with the Berkeley students uh, and offered this class, I had to go into the hallways and buttonhole them to get come and attend. And I found it was an aversion behavior in them around this fear that because they have a disability and it's prominent or observable or they're gonna mention it or need serious accommodations, they were afraid that nobody would hire them. So how do we address all that? Well, it's the content. And the content was developed over time with all these resources in place and trial and error and research behind uh, outcomes 
to refine it and advance it. Uh, it's available in three components. The first one is a 250 page self help guide or course reader, which goes through all of the content with an easy to read narrative about what is meant by that content, how to think about it, how to think new and differently about it, especially in the disability arena, and then how to come to a more positive place around your employment potential, which is empowering. The second half of the content builds on that foundation and teaches them and talks to them about the basic workplace skills. And we've identified with all these support professionals and employers what the key fundamental skills are that if you knew about them coming out of school, you would not only be competitive with your non-disabled peers, you end up being more competitive because you have the benefit of this deep insight. Most of us, if not all of us, left college or post-secondary, went to our first jobs, and we were expected to learn these things on the job. And that's how you do learn them. But what if you're given a briefing on all of these subjects? How much more powerful can you be? And not only that, but how much more will that build your self-confidence when you know you know things that your competitors don't know yet? So that's what the content is about. There's a 250-page book. There's also a six-part workshop series, which distill, distills all this down into six two-hour workshops. In both of the examples of the content, you can use all or part of it to supplement and augment what you're already doing. And a lot of programs have pieces of this content in place, but they may see where they're missing something important that they identify their students need. And they'll have what's a mini encyclopedia to build them build their courses out and to deliver more effective instruction on an individual basis when it presents the need. So that's the second part, the workshop series. The third is we had a Kessler grant and we were an employment initiative uh, Kessler grant and we were allowed to research it and track data outcomes around student learning and student employment outcomes and to expand it to two other universities and have different instructors than myself teaching this content. We had the program happening at San Diego State University through Interwork Institute, which some of you may know about, particularly in the rehab community, and also Cal State Fullerton. So for a two year run, we were able to replicate this course at these three universities with strict protocols around pre and post course surveys and track students post course and find out their employment outcomes. Since it was only a two year grant, we had about 154 students and all the data is in the proposal. And I just wanted to give you just a quick thumbnail about some of the outcomes around learning post and pre course. Here were some of the key features that we wanted to build up in our students. Believe disability is an asset to employment. Before 31% believe that, after 90% believe that. Felt unprepared for work before 51%, after only 10%. We're able to answer what work do you hope to, uh, to seek out? 46% before, 92% after. Felt comfortable in job interviews, 19% before, 86% after. Felt comfortable discussing accommodations, 28% before, 94% after. And there's 16 measurements, I've mentioned maybe six or seven or eight. So it really changes their perspective. It changed our culture at all three universities. Students started to talk in the hallways and privately about, well, what, are you, what aren't you gonna do for the summer? What kind of internship are you pursuing? Here's what I found, what did you find? They took employment from something that they were averse to, to something that they embraced and were excited about. Their hey, Paul, we're at just want to check in. We're at 13 minutes. And, okay. Uh, uh, we're uh, and the employment outcomes equal the employment outcomes for non-disabled students in that age range. So it does work. The point of the whole proposal is it needs a policy, a national policy leader, ODEP's a natural uh, suspect or nomination, along with SSA, along with uh, I think um, uh, Centers for Independent Living. What a great place to prototype this, to test this out at a place where disability consumerism is taught. How about employment empowerment alongside disability empowerment? Uh, and there are many other partners and it's all outlined for you in the proposal. 
There are two enclosures in the proposal, and I'll end with that. One is an outline of the content. Uh, it really will give you deeper insight into how comprehensive this is, how fundamental and first step oriented it is. And the second enclosure has excerpts from some of this content so you can get a feeling for how fundamental and formative and transformative it is for students, parents, family members, uh, uh, even employers, coaches, peer mentors who are wondering what they should be telling their students are in this morass or in this quagmire around really believing in themselves in competitive employment. So hopefully I'll answer more of your questions later and that the closures and the proposal will round that out and maybe in the breakout session we can go into more detail then. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and uh, we'll go right ahead and turn it over to James Smith. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's uh, James Smith from the beautiful state of Vermont, um, and I'm here to talk about um, progressive education, um, which is a strategy um, we developed to try and uh, dramatically increase the number of students um, engaging in post-secondary education and training in our state, um, students with disabilities, that is. Next slide, please. So, a quick overview of what progressive education is. Um, our um, eligible population is is really focused for us is focused on um, students and young adults with disabilities who are VR eligible, including youth who receive SSI. Um, and this would include within that students eligible for vocational rehabilitation pre employment transition services, um, which would also include students on SSI. So. For those that don't know, pre-employment transition uh, services is sort of a um, a pre a pre um, um, sort of a a, a uh, an early on ramp service to VR services um, for students in high school. Um, so. Um, as I, as I said, the progressive education approach is um, a VR based intervention. Um, that's designed to increase the proportion of youth with disabilities entering um, post secondary education and post secondary training programs. So, it starts with the assumption that every student, regardless of severity of disability is really ready for something is ready for some type of um, um, uh, educational training experience. Um, we really focus on offering students while they're still in high school early exposure to real um, post secondary experiences. Um, so, the idea here is that you don't talk about it. That doesn't help students. You, you give them real experiences, which really helps them um, get an understanding of what's in of what it's like and builds their confidence. Um, progressive education is designed to offer kind of a graduated series of experiences to sort of provide kind of um, an on ramp um, to students who um, may may have never really considered themselves as, as uh, a student who could benefit from post secondary training or education. Uh, so, um, what's, the, what's the problem? What's the challenge we're trying to solve here? So, um, we know um, there's tons of data on this that shows that students and youth with disabilities are far less likely than their peers without disabilities to attend post secondary education programs. And again, we're not just focused on on post secondary education, but training programs as well. Um, so credential training programs. Um, the, the thing that we have observed in our state and we suspect is true um, more broadly is students with disabilities are often excluded from those kind of preparation activities that occur in high school um, that, 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 that help that student um, uh, find that route towards a post secondary program. And then finally, um, um, in this modern workforce that we, we're all living with in is that if you want to move beyond uh, minimum wage employment, um, most career pathways require some type of post secondary post secondary credential. So not we don't again, we don't just mean bachelor's degree or associate's degree, but some type of industry recognized credential. Um, uh, is, is essential for, for higher wage employment. So um, the opportunity um, we believe uh, is that the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act 
radically change the VR program um, in a few ways. First of all, is it required vocational rehabilitation programs to spend 15% of our federal award on serving high school students um, as young as 14. Um, and I think this is this is clearly realigned the VR program um, to being a much more youth and student focused program. Also, very importantly, um, VR agencies are now measured not just on um, an employment outcome, but we are measured on how many of our, our customers achieve credentials. And we're also measured on um, the long-term career outcomes of our, of our customers. Um, so two and four quarters post exit. So um, vocational rehabilitation programs really cannot, we, we cannot meet our new uh, mandates without a real change or uh, what I would argue is a radical change in practice. And so progressive education, um, we developed as kind of offering a ready-made practice for VR agencies or a practice framework to meet this mandate um, to serve, um, um, to, to improve post-secondary outcomes for students with disabilities. So um, the key features of our approach are as follows. Um, we first start with the assumption, and I think this is, this is simple and easy to say, but it's actually quite a significant thing, is we start with the assumption that every student is ready for some type of experience, um, even students with most significant disabilities. So whether it's a student with a significant, a severe developmental disability, um, or a student on the autism spectrum, or a student with a physical disability, um, we, uh, uh, it, it is key we find experiences, whether they be um, uh, very light touch um, that that students could get hands on a hands on experience of um, a post secondary program while still while still in high school. Um, and um, our second sort of principle is that that um, that uh, students are far more likely to engage in a post secondary education training if they're offered kind of an, a graduated on ramp. Uh, of experiential op opportunities to try it out. Um, so when when we talk about those on ramps, um, um, we need to kind of create sort of a structure um, uh, within our program to do that. So um, what we've done, what we what we are proposing with progressive education is that the vocational um, rehabilitation transition counselor's role is redesigned. And that they they are they are given the tools to um, to provide this graduated series of options. So these might start at a very light touch in terms of um, taking uh, 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 high school students on campus tours or doing informational inf interviews. Um, those inf informational interviews might be with um, uh, uh, an employer um, that um, that runs an HVAC program, for example. Um, or with a program that provides HVAC um, training, uh, just as one example, um, or as well as a traditional um, post-secondary education, like a community college setting. Um, in our state, um, we have contracted with our community college to um, for specific classes that are kind of career prep classes for students while in high school. And these classes sort of offer again that experience for especially for students where no one in their family or um, uh, uh, has um, been uh, has been has been to college or gone into post secondary program. Um, we really try to focus on pre apprenticeship experiences for for students to explore technical careers, um, work based learning experiences linked to specific credentials. So. Let's um, let's 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 get you in a work experience in a setting where, um, let's say, um, an advanced manufacturing setting where um, you can understand what you need to know to go on. Um, and then um, we also put a strong focus on co-enrollment in in the CTE or career and technical education centers. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, um, we we it's critical that we offer substantial supports for um, students during that on ramp. So that might mean job coaching for work study, um, or, or paid or unpaid internships, 
uh, tutoring, academic tutoring, assistive technology, um, student peer mentoring um, can be can be very beneficial. Um, also, um, I think as other folks have spoke to, it's essential for for students or um, and families or students who receive SSI um, that we include a benefits planning and benefits. Um, um, a planning component to the the intervention. Uh, we know that families, um, in particular, are sometimes hesitant or reluctant to consider high wage employment because of fear of loss of um, SSI benefits to the family um, income. And so we know that benefits counselors can really reassure families and help help them take advantage of work incentives such as the student in earned income exclusion and, uh, and other work incentives. Next slide, please. So we recognize there's some strengths in our approach and we recognize there are some limitations. Um, this, we feel one of the major strengths is that it's a truly inclusive approach. Um, so I'm so sick, to be honest, of, um, of, post of, of, um, of um, sort of uh, VR agencies providing tons of supports to students who Probably we know we'll, we'll we'll go to college regardless of our support, and um, we need to focus our support on um, on uh, on students and youth who are never who maybe have never considered a post secondary education or training program, um, and and that's how we'll bend the curve or move the needle. Um, our approach doesn't require any brand new funding or, or policy. It really aligns directly with the Workforce Innovation uh, uh, and Opportunity Act mandate for VR agencies. And we're offering what we think is a, uh, a new practice model for VR agencies for transition services. The limitations, um, you know, obviously there are many other barriers um, to um, post-secondary programs for, for students with disabilities, including the high cost, in a rural state like ours, um, transportation is a big issue, though, though virtual programs are becoming way more prominent, especially since COVID. Um, it also requires strong partnership with schools and supervisory unions. And um, to be totally frank, not every high school or supervised union is on the same page um, uh, and does not always support uh, progressive education activities um, in, um, in our in our state. So there's we rely on those relationships and have to build on those relationships. Um, and so with that, I am going to end there. And thanks very much for, for um, listening to me uh, talk here. Thank you, James. And with that, we'll turn it over to our final presenters of the day. This is Colleen McKay and Marsha Ellison from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our proposal is for a demonstration of career and technical education, or CTE, for students with emotional disturbance um, using an evidence-based or evidence-informed guide for educators uh, called Translating Evidence to Support Transitions in Career and Technical Education, or TESS CTE. Next one, thank you. Uh, the youth we are focused on in this proposal is students with emotional disturbance, or students with related disabilities, such as learning disabilities, autism, or other health impairments. Uh, it's also applicable to students who are receiving special education transition services um, and students who have an individualized learning plan. Um, the guide really emphasis, emphasizes the importance of increasing use and access uh, of career and technical education for students with disabilities. And it's focused on student level outcomes, including defining a career goal in a, in a career cluster along a pathway, um, developing employability skills, uh, obtaining credits in, in career and technical education that are in an in-demand industry and related to a career pathway. These may also lead to post-secondary uh, education, employment, or training. Part of the problem, uh, as you heard earlier, is uh, as Andrew mentioned, uh, two thirds of youth uh, receiving SSI go on to receive SSI or other disability benefits as adults, and they may be inadequately prepared for employment. We know that youth with emotional disturbance uh, lag behind other students with disabilities in completing high school 
post-secondary education employment, and they also rely heavily on disability benefits. Uh, the motivation and research behind uh, test CTE are studies done by Wagner and others that found that students with uh, emotional disturbance in special education who took a concentration of CTE were more likely to obtain competitive employment. Uh, those who were taking general CTE courses were also more likely to obtain competitive employment post high school. Uh, and we know that CTE can improve employment outcomes for students with other disabilities. Uh, we believe uh, there's an opportunity. Uh, we know that career and technical education is supported through uh, Perkins 5. Uh, it's widely available um, in over 90% of high schools. It provides opportunities for education and work-based or hands-on learning. Um, it's aligned with uh, states uh, needing to provide and assure equity for special populations, including those with disabilities in their Perkins 5 plans. And it would help states and districts satisfy obligations under federal laws, such as uh, IDEA or WIOA. Um, we always focus on in demand jobs and the emphasis on collaboration across agencies, for example. Some of the key components uh, in test CTE include uh, conducting assessment and career exploration activities, um, developing an individualized learning plan and uh, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely, uh, smart post-secondary post education, training, and employment goals, um, a progression of CTE courses along a pathway that leads to uh, in-demand industries, uh, developing other IEP supports, accommodations, and activities to reinforce uh, CTE learning, and then reassessing career goals and course progression as needed. Thank you, Colleen. I, I will pick it up from here to describe uh, key features of test CTE. Uh, first of all, it is rooted in social cognitive career theory, um, and it was developed with extensive educator, special educator input, uh, and it was piloted in two states. So uh, just to uh, re restate that the test CTE is a guide for special educators who are uh, working with students uh, with emotional disturbance and students with other disabilities um, in their transition planning of their IEP program. And the intention is to help uh, educators to work with students in order to develop four credits of concentrated CTE along a career pathway. What's unique about test CTE is that we are focusing specifically on students with emotional disturbance and the their unique um, characteristics uh, that require some adaptations, uh, for example, for accommodations uh, to uh, widen the array of accommodations that are typically used for students with disabilities uh, to better accommodate students with emotional disturbance. Uh, as others here have mentioned, it is important to uh, work with students to develop a vocational identity, to be able to see themselves as workers in the future. Um, regarding CTE, as you may well know, there is a, a heavy stigma associated with CTE learners, that CTE is for uh, quote unquote dumb students or uh, students who are not going to, to college or post-secondary training. Um, and uh, the guide works with educators to uh, counteract that um, that stigma. The guide also describes different pathways that uh, students may take out of high school, whether it's to um, post-secondary college, uh, community college, four-year college, or, C or CTE uh, training, um, vocational training, and uh, works with educators how to develop a pathway of CTE courses in high school um, that is um, commensurate with that exit type. Uh, you see here a tip sheet um, that we have developed, and this tip sheet is for students, um, and that uh, educators can provide to their students schools that make school that makes sense, um, really developed with uh, youth input and uh, geared to helping uh, students recognize the value of CTE. What we are proposing in our, in our um, 
uh, paper is a demonstration of test CTE. We need to, uh, it was piloted in, in two high schools, but we need a more extensive opportunity to examine implementation factors, training and coaching procedures, uh, data collection efforts, uh, fidelity of the uh, in, uh, educators to the guide um, and costs. Um, we can acquire preliminary student outcome data, and that would move itself naturally into a fully powered multi-site clinical efficacy trial for student outcomes. Those outcomes being, do they acquire four credits of CTE along a career pathway, and has that and does that lead to post-secondary education um, uh, tra or training or employment? We also think that uh, there would be an opportunity to widen the applicab applicability of test CT to other populations and to diverse communities. Um, and uh, test CTE is written for special educators, um, but can be also written to general educators and um, uh, guidance counselors who are working with students who are not in special education, but likewise have an individual learning plan or need to develop post-secondary goals um, uh, for, for those students with disabilities. Uh, quickly, this uh, guide addresses the especially poor outcomes of students with emotional disturbance and their high use of, of disability benefits. Um, its strength is that it relies on an existing infrastructure of CTE education that is available to over 90% of the high schools in, in the US. Um, and I will pause there and turn it back to Colleen. Thank you. Andrew, if you could go to the last slide, please, the next one. Uh, just to summarize, uh, TES CTE um, would capitalize on career and technical education to improve outcomes of students with disabilities. Uh, it would meet unique needs of students with emotional disturbance, but it would also be applicable to other disability groups. It's designed to increase equity and access. Um, it's embedded within a mandated IEP transition planning. It also meets other uh, federal legislative requirements um, that we talked about earlier, such as Perkins 5 and WIOA. Uh, we do need a demonstration to examine the implementation of best practices in career and technical education for students with disabilities, including those with emotional disturbance. And uh, we also have the potential um, to develop additional models, modules for educators, students and employers, uh, service providers and family members um, through stakeholder input. These modules could be used to address disparities provide a better understanding of services and supports to meet the needs of students with disabilities in CTE. Right. Thank you. These are our contact information. And on the earlier slide is the uh, website uh, where test CTE is available. Um, the guide is uh, downloadable, is free. We have uh, the tip sheet there as well. Um, and other webinars that we where we have presented this work. Thank you, Colleen and Marcia, and thank you to Judith and Paul and James and all of our authors. Uh, we are so grateful for your uh, hard work and for sharing your innovative ideas for advancing youth transitions. Uh, now I'd like to invite Chris McLaren and David Rosenblum of ODEP uh, to provide some insights into the proposals here today. Uh, Chris, I uh, just to say a little bit of introduction, Chris is a senior economist whose research focuses on policies aimed at helping newly ill and injured workers remain in the workforce and leveraging public data to identify opportunities to improve employment outcomes uh, for people with disabilities. David is also a senior economist with the research and evaluation team at ODEP, where he engages in statistical and economic analysis. All right, thank you, Andrew, uh, and hello, everyone. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? We got you loud and clear there, Chris. Great, thank you. So, uh, uh, see, as Andrew said, my name is Chris McLaren. I'm from the Office of Disability Employment Policy 
I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I'm going to respond to the proposal by Judith Gross and colleagues on family empowerment awareness training or FEET, and the proposal by uh, Paul uh, Hippolytus on employment empowerment. So both of these proposals focus on empowering youth and their families by uh, raising expectations for competitive integrated employment among youth with disabilities. They are about changing mindsets and providing youth, their families and providers with the tools and knowledge to overcome uh, any negative stereotypes or limitations they may believe are true so they can be more confident in their abilities and have higher expectations for employment. Uh, you know, we, we all have our own strengths and abilities, uh, but sometimes you have to recognize and figure out what they are. Uh, th this is tough for young people, especially for youth with disabilities who are starting to figure out uh, their way in the world and what kind of work they want to do. And certainly can be influenced uh, by their family members and support professionals. So I'll uh, go into some specific responses to each proposal now, starting with feet. Uh, there are two essential components to feet uh, to raise expectations for competitive employment and to increase knowledge of resources, uh, services, and supports for gaining employment. The first thing that uh, stands out to me about feet is that the training is is not just for youth; it's also for their families and support providers. They also note uh, that approximately one third of attendees so far uh, are uh, professionals who support youth. And I, I was really excited to read this aspect of their proposal. The authors are upfront in mentioning that there is limited causal evidence of the impact of parental or family expectations uh, directly on youth employment outcomes, uh, given the difficulty in measuring some of these things, but. There is plenty of research uh, suggest that they cite, suggesting that it plays a major role. And I would hazard a guess that, that many educators and youth employment service providers, including many of you attending today, would agree that expectations of family and support can play a really big role. Uh, th there is a section of the training described where the youth and their families uh, separately fill out information on expectations and then compare. And I would uh, bet this is eye opening in, in many cases. There are many topics in the training, uh, but one in particular discusses different types of competitive employment, including standard employer employee type work, but also resource ownership, self employment and others. I thought this was particularly interesting because people with disabilities tend to be self employed at higher rates uh, compared to people without disabilities. And we may not uh, always be aware of the variety of employment types that are possible. Uh, another big strength of the training is that the youth come up with employment ideas, think about what their next steps to employment are, how they would achieve those goals. And then they link the, to resources that they will use to accomplish those next steps. And uh, I thought this was a really great aspect as well, because having expectations and setting goals are critical, but there really has to be follow through and a, and a plan, a plan for what to do next. Uh, FEET has been implemented and tested in five states already uh, using different organizations and funding sources, which is really promising for a wider expansion. Uh, however, the proposal is upfront in stating that scaling to a national level would be challenging because the training was is customized. Uh, but also noting that the strength, this is a strength of the training and, and I, and I would agree with that. Uh, this also made me think, uh, some of the proposals discussed previously, uh, to improve case management and linking youth to the services and, uh, supports they need. Uh, so there may be some overlap or ways to collaborate. Another question I have is about the expected effectiveness. Uh, the training is typically, uh, it was mentioned that it was two seven hour days with some follow up support. That's a lot of material to pack into two days and I just wonder how students and families will retain the information over time and what the right amount of follow up is required uh, to really improve out outcomes. But overall, this is a great proposal. Uh, now I'll move on to the proposal by Paul uh, Hippolytus on employment empowerment. So this proposal calls for a, a shift in the culture of disability programs throughout government and society uh, to promote an employment empowerment mindset among youth with disabilities and to uh, uh, promote employment empowerment through a national federal initiative and cross agency working group. So creating a shift of this magnitude is, is a big, really big picture goal. And the, and the proposal, but the proposal also provides the specific curriculum uh, 
on employment empowerment that was developed based on uh, nine years of research, implementation, and adjustment. Regarding the curriculum, it focuses on dispelling myths and negativity uh, that trigger self-doubt and explores and builds students' workplace understanding and skills around what it takes to be successful. Uh, it is encouraging that uh, piloting this curriculum is demonstrated that it can be easily taught by individuals with a positive disability perspective and prior competitive work experience and did not require any special instructor training or credentials. And that the curriculum is flexible that uh, was developed with students at post secondary institution and in, in my in, institutions in mind, uh, but could be. Um, uh, changed to to support uh, all types and levels of youth with disabilities. Uh, the extra excerpts of the curriculum are engaging um, and cover many topics, including what he calls the soft, medium, and hard skills. Uh, one interesting aspect was the discussion on accommodation strategies and speaking to your employer about accommodations in a positive, confident way. This reminded me of a study uh, by Matthew Hill and colleagues on employer accommodation and labor supply of disabled workers. They found that, uh, that few employer characteristics actually explain which workers are accommodated. It's actually employee characteristics, particularly things like assertiveness and open communication that are, were highly predictive of accommodation. So these type of skills are useful th for, for throughout uh, working career. Uh, I would appreciate a few more details on how to incorporate uh, families and providers into the trainings and how that would work. I had some of the same questions that he mentioned that would be addressed if there was a federal working group in terms of how this would be tailored and delivered in different settings and the different audiences. Uh, I was uh, interested to hear about the link um, with this type of curriculum and messaging for people with newly acquired disabilities and return to work issues. Um, regarding evidence, uh, some pre post program assessments uh, among students who took the course, uh, and, and as he mentioned, showed large gains in uh, certain attitudes, beliefs, and perspectives. And there was a follow-up to measure employment outcomes, uh, but there was no comparison group. Uh, the proposal notes that further research, development, and demonstrations are needed, and, and I, I would agree with that. In terms of the national initiative and federal working group, I can see the value in bringing various agencies and stakeholders to the table to d d discuss this topic, and maybe it could be a catalyst for change, uh, whether solely or as part of a broad discussion about the various challenges facing youth with disabilities. But it would be helpful if there were some details uh, provided to get some specific tangible goals for implementation or specific demonstration ideas for this group. Overall, both these uh, proposals were great and uh, touching on a topic that I, I think clearly needs more focus and evidence and can certainly uh, see opportunities in the future. So thanks to the authors and for the uh, opportunity to comment. And, and now I'll turn it over to my, my colleague, David Rosenblum. Thanks, Chris. And I, I trust everyone can hear me uh, uh, properly. Uh, so I'll cover the other two papers um, that you just heard. Uh, first, uh, uh, paper on progressive education and early intervention strategy to improve post-secondary outcomes uh, by Hal McCarthy, Smith, and Tila Congas, and also the paper on career and technical education for students with emotional disturbance uh, by McKay and Ellison. Uh, I want to congratulate the authors of both papers for coming up with innovative proposals um, for increasing knowledge of options relating to post-secondary outcomes. Um, and uh, increasing engagement in a, in a career and technical um, education. Um, you know, both papers are focused on uh, overcoming, as many other papers uh, that have been presented on overcoming existing barriers and uh, reaching uh, students who currently might be excluded by existing services um, and uh, aren't being provided with all they possibly could. Um, so first, uh, I'll, I'll address the paper on progressive education and uh, highlight a few of its strengths. Um, this proposal would make basic education provision and counseling universal uh, and therefore reach a lot of students who might benefit um, from the various activities specified, um, but uh, are currently being excluded for various reasons. Uh, it operates through the existing vocational rehabilitation uh, counselors, um, but at the same time, it's also improving collaboration and breaking down barriers between VR high schools. Uh, CTE centers, other relevant uh, groups of entities. Um, and uh, furthermore, one of its elements is, uh, 
is incorporating uh, benefits counseling uh, to explain options to families of students receiving SSI, um, which you know, we think is really important um, for improving their financial outcomes and explaining clearly um, also how those options relate um, to post-secondary um, training and education. Um, just to, uh, to go over a few criticisms, um, although quite a variety of activities are, are specified as being presented as options, um, the intensiveness of these activities does vary quite a lot, um, especially in terms of time payment for the participant, um, and perhaps um, you know, could, could be made clearer or have a, a better order or progression of activities um, from less intensive to more intensive. Um, all, similarly, uh, some of the activities are more focused on employment, others addressing encouraging participation and transition to higher education. Um, again, it might make sense to identify students who are more interested in one or the other um, and pre present those options first, um, perhaps with a more, uh, more tailored plan to, the, to those individual students. Um, and uh, furthermore, um, since this proposal is it's focused uh, mainly on, on presenting options, uh, making this information more available through outreach, um, but it is possible that the impact of exposure to the options could be limited um, relative to more intensive interventions. Um, moving on to the second proposal on uh, CTE for students with emotional disturbance, again, just highlighting a few strengths. Um, this is le leveraging an existing guide with high school staff who already work with students with disability um, and its intention, uh, as with the other program, is to make uh, options widely, more widely available, in this case, CTE. Um, and a particular strength is, uh, is that, uh, that the high school staff will work with each student to create an individualized plan uh, that furthermore can be modified as needed um, as they progress um, through this system. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of proposals are trying to address and improve outcomes for or youth with disability generally, uh, but in this particular proposal, it's tailored specifically to a, a subset of youth with disability, uh, those with emotional disturbance, um, which does have potential benefits of, in, of improving impacts um, for that particular group uh, by again tailoring the program to their to their uh, exact needs. Um, However, at the same time, it was a little unclear to me whether um, this program was actually intended to serve that more narrow subs subset of uh, of uh, youth with emotional disturbance uh, versus including incorporating all types of serious mental health conditions. Um, and if it wanted to kind of transition, transition to the latter um, broader group, um, then perhaps it could address what alterations to the program would be needed uh, to suit their needs. Um, there's a this proposal incorporated required uh, ongoing monthly coaching for transition uh, professionals. Um, and that has potential potential benefits in that um, in that uh, the tr training can be altered as needed and additional guidance can be provided. Um, but at the same time, that also imposes an ongoing burden and cost, um, which is missing from some programs simply providing uh, information or guidance up front. Um, and then furthermore, um, when it comes to scaling up this program, uh, there are particular op might be some obstacles, um, and that requires a. Uh, the participation and buy-in of individual schools or school districts uh, to adopt the program. Um, you know, but all in all, um, both proposals work, work quite strong and uh, per, are, are pointing towards innovative ways of, uh, again, um, of, of increasing outreach um, and making the knowledge of these options um, post-secondary or post-secondary training education uh, and for CTE a more universal uh, in, in one case, to trying to reach all students with disability, and then the other, uh, tailoring their program to the specific subset of youth with emotional disturbance. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Chris and David, um, for those thoughts. At this point, we're going to turn to uh, audience Q and A, um, and I've seen some questions coming in in the Q and A box. Uh, if other folks have questions they would like to ask, you can enter them using the Q and A panel on the right-hand side of the screen. My colleague, Gina Livermore, has been monitoring the uh, Q&A uh, box there and will be um, sharing those questions with the panelists. Okay, so first question, uh, Judith, there was a question about whether trained benefits counselors uh, 
were working as part of the, the feed intervention in the places that it, it currently operates. Yes, absolutely. So uh, one of the components of FEET, and like I said, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the face-to-face -face version mostly. We've incorporated this into the online version as well, but I like the face-to-face -face better. But one of the components we have is um, in face-to-face, -face, the morning is the information getting from us and the activities. And the afternoon is where we have the community speakers come in, community um, service providers, as well as um, uh, people who are employed to come and share about the types of jobs they have. And so on part two, when we have the service providers come in and provide support, benefit specialists are definitely in that group that we invite in. We try to get around uh, a minimum of nine representatives to come in. It might be Social Security, Medicaid, uh, VR, uh, workforce development, benefit specialists, centers for independent living, community rehab providers, um, pre ETS providers. Uh, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. But you know, we range from like nine to 15 providers that might come and talk. And we always incorporate benefit specialists. And we have a little component of our training that is specifically about uh, dispelling myths about benefits, where we do some math magic around impairment related work expenses and plans for achieving self support to show people how they can um, increase their work effort. Okay, thank you. Um, and just as a reminder, put your video on when you're speaking, just so people can see who's talking, except for me, I get to keep mine off. Um, okay, so there was a question for James uh, um, from a person who operates a, a transition program that has provided similar services as, as you discussed, but had difficulty offering on site job coaching um, when that was required uh, for students still in school and wanted to know if there were any ideas about how to address that. And maybe you can first describe the extent to which job coaches are are involved in progressive education and how you meet the demand for that if they are? Sure, thanks for the question. Um, we are fortunate in Vermont to have um, um, access to benefits counsel, uh, sorry, to job coaches, um, both through our local community rehab provider and then we also have um, job coaches who are directly employed by vocational rehabilitation. And so we've just made an investment in that service. Um, and, and calling them job coaches is a little bit of a misnomer because they're often doing a lot of um, sub direct support around, um, if, for example, if a if a if a student is is um, taking a um, um, a career uh, career and college prep class, the job coach might actually be the one who's supporting them, assisting them, you know, um, with their um, navigating that that program, so it's less of a job coach and more of a sort of tutor and support. Um, but yeah, that's how we 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 do it. Um, but we, you know, we think it's it's very difficult, um, especially for students with the most significant disabilities. If you can't provide some level of um, intensive one-on-one -on -one support, it's very hard to to um, support them in 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 these types of programs. All right, thank you. So um, there was a question directed to both um, you, James, and Colleen and Marsha, making the point that the two programs focus on similar things, connecting students to post-secondary education, but taking a different approaches to it. And if there was any opportunities to combine these approaches, or maybe Colleen and Marsha might talk about the extent to which VR is involved in, in their test CTE uh, strategy. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot at the last question. Um, the guide is written to transition uh, special education, is transition coordinators delivering special education services in high schools. Um, how That said, uh, there is a tremendous opportunity for uh, state agencies of vocational rehabilitation to coordinate with schools around pre-employment training services and capitalizing on CTE um, services. So the guide doesn't address that exactly. There is a different test guide um, that is called um, um, 
uh, for tr translating evidence to support transitions for community partnerships. And it's really about um, bringing other partners into the transition planning of IEPs, special education transition planning, most especially vocational rehabilitation, because there, there was concrete research uh, uh, done on the na National Transition Longitudinal Study that showed that when other partners like community college educators and like VR counselors who are sitting in on the um, IEP transition planning meetings, there were improved post-secondary outcomes for those students. So um, test CTE doesn't address that in particular, but the larger test program does. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and let James have a shot at it. Sure, thanks, Marsha. Yeah, I think the, the tremendous advantage that vocational rehabilitation has is that we 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 we're perhaps the only national program that has a mandate to both serve high school students and then both serve those same students as adults after they've exited the high school. So we can um we can be a tremendous if 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 we do it properly, and that's a big if. Um, we can be a tremendous, we can be a real linking resource. So uh, we can be engaged in the CTE program in high school, but then also um, um, we can be um, assist that we can be for, we can be the same person there for that youth um, when they when they exit um, exit high school. Um, and if they want to go from the CTE program, perhaps onto an apprenticeship program or to other some type of other. Um, skill program, but that we we know them, we can be with them um, all the way all the way through. Um, sorry, that was a long-winded answer. That's okay, and all of you get black mark for not turning your cameras on. Okay, I think we might have one time for one more question, but I want to give Paul. Um, he didn't have any specific questions directed to him, but if you wanted to respond to any of the comments Chris discussed during his remarks. Um, I give you the, a couple of minutes to do that if you'd like. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, Chris, I just want to tell you, I really appreciated your feedback, um, especially around uh, more details about perhaps ODEP's leadership and the initiative uh, around employment empowerment that I'm suggesting. Um, and Andrew helped me with it. And I can't remember for sure, but I think in the early drafts, we had a bit more detail. Uh, and then we got a little nervous. I got a little nervous about being too presumptuous about that. So, Chris, if you do um, want to hear more, I'm happy to share it. I've sat where you've sat, although different responsibilities and years ago. But uh, my email address is hippolitus at berkeley.edu, and I'll um, uh, get that out of the file and, you know, fix it up a little bit and be happy to share that with you for what it might be worth or not worth. Uh, I just wanted to say also that the model that I've developed was in a vacuum uh, with my own experiences. I had supports, and but it wasn't a widespread research-based effort. I always would dreamed about such things, uh, but it never materialized, and I still hope uh, for some sort of next step in that direction where things could be quantified a bit more and the evidence could be more compelling with control groups, et cetera. So it was my own, our own limitations that have brought us to this point, but it was enough there to stand up and say, raise our hand and say, ODEP, how about this? And of course we would defer to your uh, uh, pursuit of it or not and how best to do so. So Chris, thank you for that. And I will be happy to share uh, earlier drafts on that subject if you would like. 